Hello everyone, Ken here, back with another video for you. As you can see in this video, I haven't taken the time to, to do my hair. I'm still wearing my grout fit and sweating a little bit. It's hot in my office. Uh, and that's because I've been so focused on learning some new data science concepts. I've been so focused on the amazing work everyone has been doing with the 66 Days of Data Initiative. So kudos to everyone who's been following along for just the first couple of days. As you know, I'm not gonna be making a video every day related to this initiative. I probably won't even make one every week, but sometimes the videos will naturally tie in with what I'm working on uh, in general. So as a part of my data science learning for the 66 Days of Data Challenge, today I had resigned myself to go through five different Kaggle notebooks. It goes without saying, but I recommend integrating this strategy if you're participating in the challenge at all. I have talked a lot about reviewing other people's code, working through it, but I don't think I've explicitly said what that means to me or, or uh, expanded on that in any different way. I also don't think many people realize that this is one of the best ways to learn this field. In this video, I'll walk through why this approach works so well and how I go about learning from other people's Jupyter notebooks on Kaggle and GitHub. I'll also provide an example of me doing some real-time learning from a notebook at the end. So definitely stay tuned for that. Okay, why is it so important to learn from other people's code? When you're starting out, it's really unlikely that you'll know how to approach most of the problems that are out there. Even something like the Titanic data set, you really don't know where to start. You could sit down with your notebook open, trying to come up with a solution, but your limited knowledge will just force you to kind of move around in circles. Frankly, you don't know what you don't know in this scenario. By going through other people's notebooks, you'll start to see how different people go about solving these problems. First, you start to copy their solutions or tweak them slightly. And as you see more approaches, you eventually begin to understand the logic of their decision-making and can build your own solutions from scratch. To be clear, this is not something that happens quickly. It takes going through 10, 50, 100, 1,000, a million different notebooks. Okay, maybe not that far. Still, I found this is one of the quickest ways to learn. I should note that it's mostly gobbledygook for the first couple of weeks when you review someone else's code, and that's okay. You don't have to know what's happening at the initial stages. Our brains are incredible processing machines, and you'll begin to pick up patterns without even realizing it. This is probably the number one way that I learn new data science concepts. Most people learn best from examples and the notebooks on Kaggle and GitHub are some of the best possible examples out there. Working through multiple notebooks is also a great metaphor for the reinforcing nature of the data science learning process. I don't think you should just learn this field from a single resource. You should look for more than three examples or explanations for each concept that you're trying to understand. If you don't understand something, perhaps it's just a problem with how the resource you use described it. Have you thought about that? Maybe it isn't even your fault that you don't understand something. When we look at multiple different Kaggle notebooks or GitHub repos, we maximize the chances that we find an example or an explanation that resonates most with us, that we're most in tune with, that actually makes sense with our own experiences. When you're doing this, I highly recommend taking notes as well. I've been using the Notion app and I really like it, but you can also use a Jupyter notebook, a, a regular notepad, whatever you like. At the end, again, I'll show you how I go about taking notes in the example. You should also get comfortable looking up the documentation for things you don't understand as you go. This is incredibly iterative, but it's also a fun process. My approach is very simple. I go through each line of code to see if there's anything that they do that I don't understand. As I go, I'll write down all the things that I don't understand in a notebook, and I'll open the page of documentation online for that topic that I don't understand. I'll keep going through the whole notebook this way. This first pass is just looking for the different things that I'm not familiar with. After I get to the bottom, I start all the way at the top again, and I make my way through the notebook again. This time, I stop at each of the places where I didn't understand the material, and I try to understand it using the documentation that I've pulled up. I go through it once completely, so I have at least a little bit of a time frame around how long this entire exercise will take me. If it's a super long notebook, maybe I'll just do half of it or a quarter. That way I'm not just going through sequential rabbit holes and getting completely lost. 
After the second stage, if I still don't understand something, I'll highlight it and write it down and then revisit it in more depth later. Next, after I have some idea about how all of the things in my notes work, I'll find some data and try to apply the new methods or concepts that I've learned. For pure beginners, you probably just need to do the first note taking step and just make sure you understand and pay attention to the patterns that you're seeing. Here is an example of me finding notebooks to work through and going through the initial steps. Okay, everyone, here is how the magic happens. So I find the best way to go and find reasonable notebooks to look through is just going to Kaggle, clicking on notebooks, and then I sort based on the number of votes. So let's see here if I can, there we go, find most votes. And then we see we get basically the most popular notebooks on Kaggle. These have been vetted by a lot of people. A lot of people are liking them. So to me, it makes sense to generally start here. So I just opened five that I thought were interesting. I didn't want to do them all on Titanic, for example. I wanted to have some diversity of data. For me at my stage, it takes me a lot shorter to go through these and see things that I don't necessarily know. But for you, going through one of these in an hour might be a reasonable time frame, or one of these in a couple hours, especially if it's one of the longer ones. So I wanted to go through and just show you what my general process looks like. So this one is on the housing prices, advanced regression techniques, and I'm going to be going through and building out some models for this specific data set anyway in the next month, I hope. So it, this makes sense for me to go through and understand the data, but also some of the techniques that they're using. I'm also a little bit familiar with the data already because I, I've gone through and started that analysis. So what I like about these is the ones that are most popular are usually the ones for beginners, and they have a lot of information about data science in general. So you can get a lot out of the text, not just out of the code. So in this one, they kind of talk about understanding the problem, a lot of the different data science steps. So, you know, when people are asking, oh, how do I approach this problem to begin with? A lot of these introductory notebooks legitimately explain the steps that they're taking and what's going on in their mind. So you're getting that additional benefit, not just looking at the code, you're getting a peek into so inside of this person's thought process. So I'm gonna link all of these uh, special thanks to Pedro, um, and I'm going to link all the other ones. So this one is by Manav, um, Data AI, uh, I don't know who that one's by, but I'm going to link all of these in the description and also in my 66 days of data post. So you have a little bit more reference there. Regardless, let's go through and start uh, picking this apart a little bit. So I, I know what pretty much all these things do, but something that interests me, interests me is understanding warnings a little bit more. So I'll probably want to research that. I'll write that down. I know if I didn't know, for example, what the standard scaler is, I would also copy that and write it down. Going forward, I understand that he's reading in the data. He's looking at the columns of the data um, and, and whatnot. But as I keep going forward, I know what describe means. I've never used distplot. I, it's the same thing as histogram, I would imagine, in in uh, matplotlib. But I like the aesthetics of this. This seems like a, a, a reasonable thing that I'd want to learn more about, especially if I'm presenting my histograms to other people. So I can go look at this documentation. And so I usually would pull up another page. Let's just do that. And so we would want to do Seaborn documentation, uh, dist plot. There we go. So we've opened that and I can refer to that a little bit later. So as we keep going forward, oh, here's a good one. I know that there are some, some assumption, <laughs> assumptions about normality and skew with uh, when we're running regressions. So I should probably review what skewness and kurtosis, uh, kurtosis are when it comes to regression assumptions. So we're gonna go here, we're gonna do So I'm building out all these tabs and when I go back, I can just hammer through them in understanding the concepts. 
So as we go forward, this is also an interesting one. I understand what's going on here, but it, it took me a little bit. So they're combining uh, these two columns and this column is whatever variable they're putting in. So in theory, they could build a function and they would put in um, you know, this whatever column name they want and it would create a graph for that column. I'm not sure why they didn't create the function actually and they're doing it this way because they could just skip the variable and, and put it in there instead. But it took me, when I first looked at this a couple seconds to figure out how that worked and now I can think about how I do that differently, talking about it with a function or whatever that might be. So once you get to a certain point, you start to understand the process and you start to wonder why they do it this way? Is this way better than how I would have done it? In this case, I don't necessarily think that that's the case, but uh, you know, they've used this, I guess, twice, uh, potentially three times. So if you use something more than once, you generally want to write a function on it. So uh, we're looking at overall quality. This is a, a pretty cool plot, but I'm familiar with how that works. These are all just a bunch of different box plots. Um, again, this is a really big core plot. I personally understand how this works, but if I wanted to understand more about heat map later. Again, this is a, a, a graphing type thing. I would go in here, I'd print that, and then I'd go over to um, Seaborn heat map. Here we go. And so I can look at the documentation. I understand everything that goes into it and what they look like. I can change the color palettes. I can learn so much about this in general. And as we keep going here, we're seeing quite a bit about the different types of plots, the pair plots here. I've never used that, so that might be something that I would include as well. As we go down, we start to look at missing data, and we see that we have the, they've done a, a percentage and made a nice little table here of how much of the data, data is missing in each section. So I really like this. I like the tabular approach, although I have my own approach. So I use is no, I use the exact approach, same approach actually. So that validates that, uh, that the way that I've been doing it historically also works pretty well. So as we're, as we're going through other people's notebooks in the early stages, we're just learning how they do it. But now when I go through them, I compare how I would approach the problem with how they approach the problem. And I'm constantly thinking about which approach makes more sense. A lot of the time I find that other people do it better than I do. And that's something I can quickly learn and adjust and, and iterate to make myself a better data scientist on the fly. So as I go back through, I'll, you know, let's say I went through this whole workbook, I'll start at the top and I'll say, okay, so let's understand warnings. I realize I didn't open up, um, open up a page for that. So now I realize I can. So let's open up Python warning docs. And so now I can go in and read about all of the different types of warnings, uh, the filtering, whatever that might be. And again, I cannot stress enough how valuable and important the docs are. They're there to make sense, to be used, to be practical. Uh, and I cannot stress that enough. So as you can see, this approach to learning is very hands-on. It's probably different than you've approached learning data science before from a course or whatever that might be. But I also think that this approach to constantly comparing yourself to other, other people's work and understanding how they do it, getting in their brain is incredible for, for shaping your own data science landscape, understanding how you think about these problems. So I hope that you can integrate this with your data science journey and with your 66 days of data. As usual, thank you so much for watching and good luck on your data science journey.